Let's transition now to endometrial cancer. Uh, it's my opportunity to, to discuss this. Um, on May 23rd, 2017, the world changed. The world changed because we got the first FDA approval based on a biomarker. It was agnostic. 149 patients, 14 of whom were endometrial cancer, and we were drug along with it, and that allowed us to treat our patients uh, with mismatch repair deficiency with pembrolizumab. Tell us about your experience with using uh, testing for mismatch repair deficiency and using pembrolizumab in recurrent endometrial cancer in that setting. Yeah, so you know the testing for microsatellite instability has been around for quite a while. It's evolved over time uh, for, good, for good reasons. Uh, and it, but it does present a certain amount of complexity. So um, in, in that particular study you quoted, uh, most patients, not all, but most patients were, were subjected to the PCR assay, which is looking actually at microsatellites um, and, and their variability. I think part of that was because the study had a predominance of colorectal cancer patients. Um, the alternative assay, which I think a lot of us use now and is, is in most path departments, is actual staining for the four genes, okay. right? And these are the mismatch repair genes. The, the absence of any one of them is then um, re leads to a diagnosis of, of um, uh, mismatch repair deficiency. Um, it turns out that if you do a systematic analysis, if you just do PCR, you can miss mismatch repair because if there's no tissue in there, no tumor, right. you, you, you miss about five to six percent. It also goes the other way, uh, although I've not experienced that, that IHC t tumor sits on the desktop, it's not processed right, and you get bad staining. So in this study, most got PCR, some got immunostaining. I think throughout the country, immunostaining dominates. I don't know what people feel so like. So are you doing yeah. IHC for the mismatch repair deficiency genes on endometrial cancer? Standardly across standardly. the population. Very standardly. Yep. Yep. So, and then we've learned that the most common abnormality is MLH1. And when the MLH1 is deficient, you have to look for promoter hypermethylation as an epigenetic, epigenetic silencing. And anything else probably should be referred for Lynch syndrome testing. So, so you have this opportunity to create a uh, biomarker for therapy, but also a biomarker for Lynch syndrome testing. Unlike pdl one testing in cervical cancer where you wait until they get metastatic disease, here we test early on because we're testing also for Lynch syndrome. Mm -hmm. and, and you've had a good experience with that? And absolutely, okay. absolutely. And we've detected about 3% of our patients with Lynch that way. Yeah, so that's a good lesson. So that 30% have mismatch repair deficiency but probably only a tenth of those have Lynch syndrome. Okay. And, and it can't be emphasized enough the importance of testing both in ovarian cancer and in this setting for uterine cancer because it's an opportunity to not only help guide treatment for this patient and inform on prognosis, but the cascade testing saves lives. Yes. Finding out that these mutations exist in relatives where you can do uh, risk reduction strategies, including surgery, makes all the difference in the world. And Karen Liu showed it a long time ago, but up to 50% of Lynch syndromes are actually diagnosed through the endometrial pathway. Everyone thinks of them as just being yeah. related so to So testing prognostic, helps guide therapy, informs you know the risk for relatives, but also informs the risk of other cancers like colon cancer or breast cancer. Sounds like BRCA, colon. right? Yep. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think the one other great unknown, which we don't have enough data for, is what happens somatically with recurrence. Mm -hmm. We need more biopsies out there. Can you get a mismatch repair abnormality later on in the mm -hmm. history of the disease?